Into the Wild by John Krakauer Chapter 16 The Alaska Interior I wish to acquire the simplicity, native feelings, and virtues of savage life. To divest myself of the fictitious habits, prejudices, and imperfections of civilization, and to find, amidst the solitude and grandeur of the western wilds, more correct views of human nature and of the true interests of man. The season of snows was preferred that I might experience the pleasure of suffering and the novelty of danger. Estwick Evans, a pedestrian tour of 4,000 miles through the western states and territories during the winter and spring of 1818. Wilderness appealed to those bored or disgusted with man and his works. It not only offered an escape from society, but also was an ideal stage for the romantic individual to exercise the cult that he frequently made of his own soul. The solitude and total freedom of the wilderness created a perfect setting for either melancholy or exultation. Roderick Nash, Wilderness and the American Mind on April 15, 1992, Chris McCandless departed Carthage, South Dakota in the cab of a Mack truck hauling a load of sunflower seeds. His Great Alaskan Odyssey was underway. Three days later, he crossed the Canadian border at Roosevelt, British Columbia, and thumbed north through Skookumachuk and Radium Junction, Lake Louise and Jasper, Prince George and Dawson Creek, where, in the town center, he took a snapshot of the signpost marking the official start of the Alaska Highway, Mile Zero, the sign reads, Fairbanks, 1,523 miles. Hitchhiking tends to be difficult on the Alaska Highway. It's not unusual on the outskirts of Dawson Creek to see a dozen or more doleful-looking men and women standing along the shoulder with extended thumbs. Some of them may wait a week or more between rides but McCandless experienced no such delay. On April 21st, just six days out of Carthage, he, he arrived at Laird River Hot Springs at the threshold of the Yukon River. There is a public campground at Laird River from which a boardwalk leads half a mile across the marsh to a series of natural thermal pools. It is the most popular way stop on the Alaska Highway and McCandless decided to pause there for a soak in the soothing waters. When he finished bathing and attempted to catch another ride north, however, he discovered that his luck had changed. Nobody would pick him up. Two days after arriving, he was still at Leard River, impatiently going nowhere. At 6.30 on a brisk Thursday morning, the ground still frozen hard, Gaylord Stuckey walked out on the boardwalk to the largest of the pools, expecting to have the place to himself. He was surprised, therefore, to find someone already in the steaming water, a young man who introduced himself as Alex. Stucky, bald and cheerful, a ham-faced 63-year-old Hoosier, was en route from Indiana to Alaska to deliver a new motor home to a Fairbanks RV dealer, a part-time line of work in which he dabbled since retiring after 40 years in the restaurant business. When he told McCandless his destination, the boy exclaimed, Hey, that's where I'm going, too but I've been stuck here for a couple days now trying to get a lift. You mind if I ride with you? Oh, Jiminy, Stucky replied. I'd love to, son, but I can't. The company I work for has a strict rule against picking up hitchhikers. It could get me canned. As he chatted with McCandless the, through the sulfurous mist, though, bloop, 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 bloop. as he chatted with McCandless through the sulfurous mist, though, Stucky began to reconsider. Alex was clean-shaven and had short hair. I could tell by the language he used he was a real sharp fella. He wasn't what you'd call a typical hitchhiker. I'm usually leery of him. I figure there's probably something wrong with a guy if he can't even afford a bus ticket. So anyway, after about half an hour, I said, I'll tell you what, Alex. Laird is a thousand miles from Fairbanks. I'll take you 500 miles as far as White House. You'll be able to get a ride the rest of the way from there. A day and a half later, however... When they arrived in Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon Territory and the largest, most cosmopolitan town on the Alaska Highway, Stucky had come to enjoy McCandless's company so much that he changed his mind and agreed to drive the boy the entire distance. Alex didn't come out and say too much at first, Stucky reports, but it's a long, slow drive. We spent a total of three days together on those washboard roads, and by the end, he kind of let his guard down. 
I tell you what, he was a dandy kid. Real courteous. He didn't cuss or use a lot of th that there slang. You could tell he came from a nice family. Mostly he talked about his sister. He didn't get along with his folks too good, I guess. Told me his dad was a genius, a NASA rocket scientist. But he'd been a bigamist at one time, and that kind of went against Alex's grain. Said he hadn't seen his parents in a couple of years since his college graduation. McCandless was candid with Stucky about his intent to spend the summer alone in the bush, living off the land. He said it was something he'd wanted to do since he was little, says Stucky. Said he didn't want to see a single person, no airplanes, no sign of civilization. He wanted to prove to himself that he could make it on his own, without anybody else's help. Stucky and McCandless arrived in Fairbanks on the afternoon of April 25th. The older man took the boy to a grocery store, where he bought a big bag of rice. And then, Alex said he wanted to go out to the university to study up on what kind of plants he could eat, berries and things like that. I told him, Alex, you're too early. There's still two foot, three foot of snow on the ground. There's nothing growing yet. But his mind was pretty well made up. He was champing at the bit to get out there and start hiking. Stucky drove to the University of Alaska campus on the west end of Fairbanks and dropped McCandless off at 5.30 p.m. Before I let him out, Stucky says, I told him, Alex, I've driven you a thousand miles. I fed you and fed you for three straight days. The least you can do is send me a letter when you get back from Alaska. And he promised he would. I also begged and pleaded with him to call his parents. I can't imagine anything worse than having a son out there and not knowing where he's at for years and years, not knowing whether he's living or dead. Here's my credit card number, I told him. Please call them. But all he said was, maybe I will and maybe I won't. After he left, I thought, oh, why didn't I get his parents' phone number and call them myself? But everything just kind of happened so quick. After dropping McCandless at the university, Stucky drove into town to deliver the RV to the appointed dealer, only to be told that the person responsible for checking in new vehicles had already gone home for the day and wouldn't be back until Monday. Leaving Stucky, with two days to kill in Fairbanks before he could fly home to Indiana. On Sunday morning, with time on his hands, he returned to the campus. I hoped to find Alex and spend another day with him, take him sightseeing or something. I looked for a couple of hours, drove all over the place, but didn't see hide or hair of him. He was already gone. After taking his leave of Stucky on Saturday evening, McCandless spent two days and three nights in the vicinity of Fairbanks, mostly at the university, in the campus bookstore tucked away on the bottom shelf of the Alaska section. He came across the scholarly, exhaustively researched field guide to the region's edible plants, Tanana plant lore, Denana Kitnuna, an ethnobotany of the Denana Indians of South Central Alaska by Priscilla Russell Carey. From a postcard rack near the cash register, he picked out two cards of a polar bear, on which he sent his final messages to Wayne Westerberg and Jan Burris from the university post office. Perusing the classified ads, McCandless found a used gun to buy, a semi-automatic 22 caliber Remington with a 4x20 scope and a plastic stock, a model called the Nylon 66, no longer in production. It was a favorite of Alaska trappers because of its lightweight and reliability. He closed a deal in a parking lot, probably paying about $125 for the weapon, and then purchased four 100-round boxes of hollow-point long rifle shells from a nearby gun shop. At the conclusion of his preparations in Fairbanks, McCandless loaded up his pack and started hiking west from the university. Leaving the campus, he walked past the Geophysical Institute, a tall glass and concrete building capped with a large satellite dish, the dish, one of the most distinctive landmarks on the Fairbanks skyline, had been erected to collect data from satellites equipped with synthetic aperture radar of Walt McCandless's design. Walt had in fact visited Fairbanks during the startup of the receiving station and had written some of the software crucial to its operation. If the Geophysical Institute prompted Chris to think of his father as he tramped by, the boy left no record of it. Four miles west of town, in the evening's deepening chill, McCandless pitched his tent on a patch of hard frozen ground surrounded by birch trees, 
not far from the crest of a bluff overlooking Gold Hill, Gas, and Liquor. Fifty yards from his camp was the terrace road cut of the George Parks Highway, the road that would take him to the Stampede Trail. He woke early on the morning of April 28th, walked down to the highway in the pre-dawn gloaming, and was pleasantly surprised when the first vehicle to come along pulled over to give him a lift. It was a gray Ford pickup with a bumper sticker on the back that declared, I fish, therefore I am, Petersburg, Alaska. The driver of the truck, an electrician on his way to Anchorage, wasn't much older than McCandless. He said his name was Jim Galleon. Three hours later, Galleon turned his truck west off the highway and drove as far as he could down an unplowed side road. When he dropped McCandless off on the Stampede Trail, the temperature was in the low 30s. It would drop into the low teens at night, and a foot and a half of crusty spring snow covered the ground. The boy could hardly contain his excitement. He was at long last, about to be alone in the vast Alaska wilds. As he trudged expectantly down the trail in a fake fur parka, his rifle slung over one shoulder, the only food McCandless carried was a ten-pound bag of long-grained rice and the two sandwiches and bag of corn chips that Galeon had contributed. A year earlier, he'd subsisted for more than a month beside the Gulf of California on five pounds of rice and a bounty of fish caught with a cheap rod and reel, an experience that made him confident he could harvest enough food to survive an extended stay in the Alaska wilderness, too. The heaviest item in McCandless's half-full backpack was his library, nine or ten paper-bound books, most of which had been given to him by Jan Burris and Nyland. Among these volumes were titles by Thoreau and Tolstoy and Gagol, but McCandless was no literary snob. He simply carried what he thought he might enjoy reading, including mass-market books by Michael Crichton, Robert Persig, and Louis L'Amour. Having neglected to pack writing paper, he began a laconic journal on some blank pages in the back of Tanana Plant Lore. The Healy Terminus of the Stampede Trail is traveled by a handful of dog mushers, ski tours, and snow machine enthusiasts during the winter months, but only until the frozen rivers begin to break up. In late March or early April, by the time McCandless headed into the bush, there was open water flowing on most of the larger streams, and nobody had been very far down the trail for two or three weeks. Only the faint remnants of a packed snow machine track remained for him to follow. McCandless reached the Teklanika River his second day out. Although the banks were lined with a jagged shelf of frozen overflow, no ice bridges spanned the channel of open water, so he was forced to wade. There had been a big thaw in early April, and breakup had come early in 1992, but the weather had turned cold again, so the river's volume was quite low when McCandless crossed, probably thigh-deep at most allowing him to splash to the other side without difficulty. He never suspected that in so doing, he was crossing his Rubicon. To McCandless's inexperienced eye, there was nothing to suggest that two months hence, as the glaciers and snowfields of the Teklanika's headwater thawed in the summer heat, its discharge would multiply nine or ten times in volume, transforming the river into a deep, violent torrent that bore no resemblance to the gentle brook he had blithely waded across in April. From his journal, we know that on April 29th, McCandless fell through the ice somewhere. It probably happened as he traversed a series of melting beaver ponds just beyond the Teklanika's western bank. But there is nothing to indicate that he suffered any harm in the mishap. A day later, as the trail crested a ridge, he got his first glimpse of Mount McKinley's high, blinding white bulk warts. And a day after that, May 1st, some 20 miles down the trail from where he was dropped by Galeon, he stumbled upon the old bus beside the Sashana River. It was outfitted with a bunk and a barrel stove, and previous visitors had left the improvised shelter stocked with matches, bug dope, and other essentials. Magic bus day, he wrote in his journal. He decided to lay over for a while in the vehicle and take advantage of its crude comforts. He was elated to be there inside the bus on a sheet of weathered plywood spanning a broken window McCandless scrawled an exultant declaration of independence two years he walks the earth 
No phone, no pool, no pets, no cigarettes. Ultimate freedom. An extremist. An aesthetic voyager whose home is the road. Escaped from Atlanta, thou shalt not return, cause the West is the best. And now after two rambling years comes the final and greatest adventure, the climactic battle to kill the false being within, and victoriously conclude the spiritual revolution. Ten days and nights of freight trains and hitchhiking bring him to the great white north. No longer to be poisoned by civilization, he flees and walks alone upon the land to become lost in the wild. Alexander Supertramp, May 1992 Reality, however, was quick to intrude on McCandless's revere. He had difficulty killing game, and the daily journal entries in his first week in the bush include weakness, snowed in, and disaster. He saw but did not shoot a grizzly on May 2nd, shot at but missed some ducks on May 4th, and finally killed and ate a spruce grouse on May 5th, but he didn't shoot anything else until May 9th when he bagged a single small squirrel, by which point he'd written Fourth Day Famine in the journal. But soon thereafter, his fortunes took a sharp turn for the better. By mid-May, the sun was circling high in the heavens, flooding the taiga with light. The sun dipped below the northern horizon for fewer than four hours out of every 24, and at midnight the sky was still bright enough to read by. Everywhere but on the north-facing slopes and in the shadowy ravines, the snowpack had melted down to bare ground, exposing the previous season's rose hips and lingonberries, which McCandless gathered and ate in great quantity. He also became much more successful at hunting game, and for the next six weeks feasted regularly on squirrel, spruce grouse, duck, goose, and porcupine. On May 22nd, a crown fell off one of his molars, but the event didn't seem to dampen his spirits much, because the following day, he scrambled up the nameless, hump-like 3,000-foot butte that rises directly north of the bus, giving him a view of the whole icy sweep of the Alaska Range and mile after mile of uninhabited country. His journal entry for the day is characteristically terse, but unmistakably joyous. Climb Mountain. McCandless had told Galen that he intended to remain on the move during his stay in the bush. I'm just going to take off and keep walking west, he said. I might walk all the way to the Bering Sea. On May 5th, after pausing for four days at the bus, he resumed his preambulation. It appears that McCandless lost or intentionally left the by now indistinct stampede trail and headed west and north through the hills above the Sashana River, hunting game as he went. It was slow going. In order to feed himself, he had to devote a large part of each day to stalking animals. Moreover, as the ground thawed, his route turned into a gauntlet of boggy muskeg and impenetrable alder, and McCandless belatedly came to appreciate one of the fundamental, if counterintuitive, axioms of the North. Winter, not summer, is the preferred season for traveling over land through the bush. Faced with the obvious folly of his original ambition to walk 500 miles to Tidewater, he reconsidered his plans. On May 19th, having traveled no farther west than the Toclet River, less than 15 miles beyond the bus, he turned around. A week later, he was back at the derelict vehicle, apparently without regret. He decided that the Sashana drainage was plenty wild to suit his purposes and that the Fairbanks Bus 142 would make a fine base camp for the remainder of the summer. Ironically, the wilderness surrounding the bus, the patch of overgrown country where McCandless was determined to become lost in the wild, scarcely qualifies as wilderness by Alaska standards. Less than 30 miles to the east is a major thoroughfare, the George Parks Highway. Just 16 miles to the south, beyond an escarpment of the outer range, hundreds of tourists ramble daily into Denali National Park over a road patrolled by the National Park Service. And unbeknownst to the aesthetic voyager, scattered within a six-mile radius of the bus are four cabins, although none happen to be occupied during the summer of 1992. But despite the relative proximity of the bus to civilization, for all practical purposes, McCandless was cut off from the rest of the world. 
He spent nearly four months in the bush, all told, and during that period he didn't encounter another living soul. In the end, the Sashana River site was sufficiently remote to cost him his life. In the last week of May, after moving his few possessions into the bus, McCandless wrote a list of housekeeping chores on a parchment-like strip of birch bark, collect and store ice from the river for refrigerating meat, cover the vehicle's missing windows with plastic, lay in a supply of firewood, clean the accumulation of old ash from the stove, and under the heading, Long Term, he drew up a list of more ambitious tasks. Map the area. Improvise a bathtub. Collect skins and feathers to sew into clothing. Construct a bridge across a nearby creek. Repair mess kit. Blaze a network of hunting trails. The diary entries following his return to the bus catalog a bounty of wild meat. May 28th, gourmet duck. June 1st, five squirrel. June 2nd, porcupine, parmigan. Four squirrel, gray bird. June 3rd, another porcupine, four squirrel, two gray bird, ash bird. June 4th, a third porcupine, squirrel, gray bird. On June 5th, he shot a Canada goose as big as a Christmas turkey. Then, on June 9th, he bagged the biggest prize of all, moose, he recorded in the journal. Overjoyed, the proud hunter took a photograph of himself kneeling over his trophy, a rifle thrust triumphantly over his head, his features distorted in a rictus of ecstasy and amazement, like some unemployed janitor who'd gone to Reno and won a million-dollar jackpot. Although McCandless was enough of a realist to know that hunting game was an unavoidable component of living off the land, he had always been ambivalent about killing animals. That ambivalence turned to remorse soon after he shot the moose. It was relatively small, weighing perhaps 600 or 700 pounds, but it nevertheless amounted to a huge quantity of meat, believing that it was morally indefensible to waste any part of an animal that had been shot for food. McCandless spent six days toiling to preserve what he had killed before it spoiled. He butchered the carcass under a thick cloud of flies and mosquitoes, boiled the organs into a stew, and then laboriously excavated a burrow in the face of the rocky stream bank directly below the bus, in which he tried to cure by smoking the immense slabs of purple flesh. Alaskan hunters know that the easiest way to preserve meat in the bush is to slice it into thin strips and then air dry it out on a makeshift rack. But McCandless, in his naivety, relied on the advice of hunters he'd consulted in South Dakota, who advised him to smoke his meat, not an easy task under the circumstances. Butchering extremely difficult, he wrote in the journal on June 10th. Fly in mosquito hordes. Remove intestines, liver, kidneys, one lung, steaks. Get hindquarters and leg to stream. June 11th. Remove half rib cage and steaks. Can only work nights. Keep smokers going. June 13th. Get remainder of rib cage, shoulder and neck to cave. Start smoking. June 14th. Maggots all ready. Smoking appears ineffective. Don't know. Looks like disaster. I now wish I had never shot the moose, one of the greatest tragedies of my life. At that point, he gave up on preserving the bulk of the meat and abandoned the carcass to the wolves. Although he castigated himself severely for this waste of a life he'd taken, a day later, McCandless appeared to regain some perspective for his journal notes. Henceforth, we'll learn to accept my errors, however great they may be. Shortly after the Moose episode, McCandless began to read Thoreau's Walden in the chapter titled Higher Laws, in which Thoreau ruminates on the morality of eating. McCandless highlighted, When I had caught and cleaned and cooked and eaten my fish, they seemed not to have fed me essentially. It was insignificant and unnecessary, and cost more than it came to. The Moose, McCandless wrote in the margin, and in the same passage he marked, the repugnance to animal food is not the effect of experience, but is an instinct. It appeared more beautiful to live low and fare hard in many respects, and though I never did so, 
I went far enough to please my imagination. I believe that every man who has ever been earnest to preserve his higher or poetic faculties in the best condition has been particularly inclined to abstain from animal food and from much food of any kind. It is hard to provide and cook so simple and clean a diet as will not offend the imagination, but this, I think, is to be fed when we feed the body. They should both sit down at the same table, yet perhaps this may be done. The fruits eaten temperately need not make us ashamed of our appetites, nor interrupt the worthiest pursuits, but put an extra condiment in your dish, and it will poison you. Yes, wrote McCandless, and two pages later, consciousness of food, eat and cook with concentration, holy food. On the back pages of the book that served as his journal, he declared, I am reborn. This is my dawn. Real life has just begun. Deliberate living, conscious attention to the basics of life, and a constant attention to your immediate environment and its concerns. Example, a job, a task, a book, anything requiring efficient concentration. Circumstance has no value. It is how one relates to a situation that has value. All true meaning resides in the personal relationship to a phenomenon, what it means to you. The great holiness of food, the vital heat, positivism, the insurpassable joy of the life aesthetic, absolute truth and honesty, reality, independence, finality, stability, consistency. As McCandless gradually stopped rebuking himself for the waste of the moose, the contentment that began in mid-May resumed and seemed to continue through early July. Then, in the midst of this idol, came the first of two pivotal setbacks. Satisfied, apparently, with what he had learned during his two months of solitary life in the wild, McCandless decided to return to civilization. It was time to bring his final and greatest adventure to a close and get himself back to the world of men and women where he could chug a beer, talk philosophy, and thrall with strangers. He seemed to have moved beyond his need to assert so adamantly his autonomy, his need to separate himself from his parents. Maybe he was prepared to forgive their imperfections. Maybe he was even prepared to forgive some of his own. McCandless seemed ready, perhaps, to go home. Or maybe not. We cannot do more than speculate about what he intended to do after he walked out of the bush. There is no question, however, that he intended to walk out. Writing on a piece of birch bark, he made a list of things to do before he departed. Patch jeans, shave, organize, pack. Shortly thereafter, he propped his Minolta on an empty oil drum and took a snapshot of himself, brandishing a yellow disposable razor and grinning at the camera. Army blanket stitched into the knees of his filthy jeans. He looks, he looks healthy, but alarmingly gaunt. Already his cheeks are sunken. The tendons of his neck stand out like taut cables. On July 2nd, McCandless finished reading Tolstoy's Family Happiness, having marked several passages that moved him. He was right in saying that the only certain happiness in life is to live for others. I have lived through much, and now I think I have found what is needed for happiness. A quiet, secluded life in the country with the possibility of being useful to people to whom it is easy to do good and who are not accustomed to have it done to them. Then work, which one hopes may be of some use. Then rest, nature, books, music, love for one's neighbor. Such is my idea of happiness. And then, on top of all that, you for a mate and children, perhaps. What more can the heart of a man desire? Then, on July 3rd, he shouldered his backpack and began the 20-mile hike to the improved road. Two days later, halfway there, he arrived in heavy rain at the beaver ponds that blocked access to the west bank of the Teklanika River. In April, they'd been frozen over and hadn't presented an obstacle. Now he must have been alarmed to find a three-acre lake covering the trail. To avoid having to wade through the murky chest-deep water, he scrambled up a steep hillside, bypassed the ponds on the north, 
and then dropped back down the river at the mouth of the gorge. When he'd first crossed the river, 67 days earlier in the freezing temperatures of April, it had been an icy but gentle knee-deep creek, and he'd simply strolled across it. On July 5th, however, the Teklanika was at full flood, swollen with rain and snowmelt from glaciers high in the Alaska Range, running cold and fast. If he could reach the far shore, the remainder of the hike to the highway would be easy, but to get there he would have to negotiate a channel some 100 feet wide. The water, opaque with glacial sediment and only a few degrees warmer than the ice it had so recently been, was the color of wet concrete. Too deep to wade, it rumbled like a freight train. The powerful current would quickly knock him off his feet and carry him away. McCandless was a weak swimmer and had confessed to several people that he was in fact afraid of the water. Attempting to swim the numbingly cold torrent or even to paddle some sort of improvised raft across seemed too risky to consider. Just downstream from where the trail met the river, the Teklanika erupted into a chaos of boiling white water as it accelerated through the narrow gorge. Long before he could swim or paddle to the far shore, he'd be pulled into these rapids and drown. In his journal, he wrote, Disaster, reined in, river, look impossible, lonely, scared. He concluded correctly that he would probably be swept to his death if he attempted to cross the Teklanika at that place in those conditions. It would be suicidal. It was simply not an option. If McCandless had walked a mile or so upstream, he would have discovered that the river broadened into a maze of braided channels. If he'd scouted carefully by trial and error, he might have found a place where these braids were only chest deep, as strong as the current was running, it would have certainly knocked him off his feet. But by dog paddling and hopping along the bottom as he drifted downstream, he could conceivably have made it across before being carried into the gorge or succumbing to hypothermia. But it would still have been a very risky proposition. And at that point, McCandless had no reason to take such a risk. He'd been fending for himself quite nicely in the country. He probably understood that if he was patient and waited, the river would eventually drop to a level where it could be safely forded. After weighing his options, therefore, he settled on the most prudent course. He turned around and began walking to the west, back toward the bus, back into the fickle heart of the bush.